Hello and welcome everyone to episode 13 of DigiTales. My name is Fezan Sayed, founder and CEO of East River. And today I have someone, an international guest of mine, who is extremely well known in South Africa because he has the number one podcast out there. He's a best-selling author of four books with his fifth coming out. He is a futurist. He is a faculty member of the Singularity University and of Duke Corporate Education as well as being an associate partner in the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, which is one of the oldest and has been around advising big people for a long time. And he is someone super interesting to talk to. John Sane, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful, man. It's uh, great to actually chat to you again. We had a wonderful time together in Egypt. Great to be connecting again. And I actually look forward to coming to Pakistan and uh, spending a bit more time with you there. You need to come here. We need to learn about the future because we really are stuck in the past in this country. You need to tell me first thing, how is it that someone can prepare for the future? Because we humans are just completely sort of opposed to change Mm. and future requires adjustment all the time. Mm. So how do we prepare for that? Yeah, look, it's, 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 At any stage, it's difficult to prepare for the future, especially at the pace that we're going with now, which makes it extraordinarily tough. And so let's not take away anything from the fact that our brains love predictability. Our brains love an absolute outcome because our brains are machines to look for habits. Our brains always trying to make something a habit so they can save as much energy and being um, energetic and optimistic for uncertainty takes a very specific type of fitness. And what we can do is train our brains to become okay with uncertainty and to become um, excited with challenge. And that's really a decision that we need to make. There's lots of research from Stanford University that talks about this idea that growth mindset is the decision to seek discomfort. It's the decision to want to put yourself in a place where your brain hurts um, often when you're dealing with new information. So you're and basically forcing your mind to be okay being uncomfortable all the time. Think about somebody who runs the Ironman or somebody right. who does a marathon. It's exactly the same decision, except you're not doing it with your body only. Well, look, obviously all of those are all mental stories, but this is just a mental exercise that just like an athlete has to take to push themselves further, we have to. And so they're able to do it. I did the Ironman last year. And what it did was it reassessed or recalibrated my relationship with pain. And I think that's what we need to do is we need to decide that it's okay to be uncomfortable, confused, but ultimately excited about the future. And so what happens is people become sort of a slave to the pain itself. And therefore, they try to avoid that entire experience. How, How do you get through that point where you say, you know what? I'm okay with this decision where I experience pain. How do you, how do you sort of build that muscle memory? So there's a difference between a, a to-do list and a to-be list. And what we are very, very good at as human beings is to-do lists, right? And a to-do list is when you've got your head down and you're operational. Mm-hmm. A to-be list says, I'm looking into the future and I'm deciding who I want to be. And from that point, I'm going to work backwards to achieve who I want to be. Now, this creates the massive difference between motivation and discipline. Motivation is required when you haven't decided who you want to be. Discipline is established when you decide who you want to be. There's a shift inside your brain. So again, let's go back to the Ironman. Waking up six days a week, very early in the morning, in the middle of winter in South Africa, which is cold and rainy in Cape Town especially, Mm -hmm. And going into those workouts when you know you're going to be cold, when you know it's not going to be comfortable, that was a decision I made that created the discipline that there was no going back from because I'd made the decision. And so really it comes down to your own emotional fitness of who you think you are and what you think you're capable of doing. How do you get that discipline? A lot of people sort of, they start strong. There's these New Year's resolutions. There's so many fitness regimes, diets, boot camps. And then you have two weeks, three weeks in, suddenly you're sort of fading out, you're you're succumbing to the pressures of everyday life. How do you ensure that level of discipline to bring you from where you are to where you want to be, regardless of how long it takes? 
Yeah, so look, I think everybody's different, right? You have very militant people, which I'm not one, and then you get very lazy people. So right across the board, everybody's got their own personality type. And I think really it's up to you to decide what's acceptable and what not, what's not acceptable. What are the deal breakers that you have with yourself? So for example, you know, if you are putting on a workout regime, just make it two days a week to start with or three right. days a week to start with and then move up. Because I think what we usually do, we go from black to white. We go from, from nothing to six days a week. And that's right. never going to work. That's the first thing. The second thing is, being held responsible inside a community that you do this work with changes everything. And so with the Ironman, it's a whole crew of people that are on a WhatsApp and you're all chatting about what time you're meeting. Is it raining? What are you wearing? You're held accountable. You're in a community. Workouts, yeah. studying. And I, I have a group of friends that meet. we meet every Wednesday night and we talk about everything crypto. And now we held accountable by our community to do the homework and go back and present and hear. And so I think it's two things. Be realistic about the goals you're setting. You can't climb Mount Everest in January 1st because you've just decided to. And two, have a community around you to hold you accountable. The community point is very important because it seems as though as things evolve in the digital space, and you know we have conversations around this whole notion of the metaverse and crypto and NFTs, there's a whole community that's driving that change and driving everything. Tell me a little bit about how community, in your view, might drive how our shift towards the future takes us into more of a digital realm. Well, look, I think before I tell you that, you know, I did some research around some of the happiest people in the world. Mm -hmm. And as far as societies are concerned, Denmark is always in the top three. And if you look at the detail of how the Denmark society is set up, <clears throat> it's amazing because every person in Denmark belongs to 3.4, on average, social groups that meet weekly. That means that on a Monday, you're doing something with books. On a Wednesday, you're all walking your dogs together. On a Saturday, you're going cycling. On a Sunday, you... So this idea of community is really where we realize where our deepest satisfaction and our deepest connections and memories come from. And so as we are moving into this digital age, which I think is awesome, and we have a look at us right here, you know, we've got having this amazing uh, discussion, but if we didn't connect in Egypt and we didn't spend that time together in that little community that we just had three days with, right. it wouldn't be the warmth between us. So what I think is going to be happening in the future is we will prioritize community connections between us and other people as we start to evolve and start to study the cultures that are the happiest and then utilize technology for what it is. I think whenever human beings are given a new tool, mm -hmm. they don't quite understand it. I mean, if you think about the very first TV ad that was ever filmed was the Barbie doll ad. And the Barbie doll ad was a man reading the radio ad on TV. That's right. what we understood from that media, right? So today, what we must understand is that we are very new in the world of technology and social media. So yes, have we gone to extremes? Absolutely. Are we learning from them? Absolutely. So I think there'll be a beautiful merge of community-led ideation and togetherness while we utilize technology for its right, rightful purposes. So that means, so linking this to the earlier point around being future ready and being sort of prepared for change. If I want to build the muscle memory of accepting change and accepting that pain that you go through as long as i wrap myself around a community that does the same i'll be able to get there quicker is what you're saying make the decision who do you want to be work backwards from that surround yourself with the community and now you have discipline that's accountable that for me has always been my easiest way of doing it interesting so tell me one other thing now everyone talks about the future and they're like you know in the future this is going to happen this is going to happen first of all there's this concept of singularity, right? You're also a member of the Singularity University. Talk to me about what is singularity and how is it going to affect us? Well, look, everybody's got a different idea of when singularity is going to happen or even if singularity is going to happen. As far as Singularity University is concerned, it's very much based on Ray Kurzweil's work. And Ray Kurzweil's become, I mean, he's seen as one of the 10 top geniuses that ever lived in America. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's ranked number six, which is just an incredible... Um, uh, uh, 
just incredible that he's been able to achieve that. And he heads up AI for Google. And I think AI and Google is like 10 steps ahead of everybody else. Right. So Ray Kurzweil's book, Singularity, has an 86% hit rate of his wow. predictions coming true. So he's not, he's, not, uh, he's not somebody to be joked around with. But what he says is that I think it's 1930, I mean, 2036 or 2042. That date also keeps changing because technology's speed is also changing. Right. Um, that singularity is when computers become or technology becomes smarter than human beings. And if you think about how AI is right now, it's very narrow in its ability to be intelligent. In other yep. words, the self-driving car can't make a piece of toast and a, right. a brilliant toaster can't drive. Right. And then we'll get to general AI, which is then a mix of uh, a bit smarter. And then we'll get to super AI. And this is where singularity fits in, where technology then becomes smarter than us as human beings. So look, nobody knows how that's going to pan out. Um, right. I, I have worked with a guy called Mo Gawat, and he was uh, a director at Google X. And Google X is doing these 20, 30 year businesses in the future. And what he was saying is that AI will learn their behavior from us. And so what we need to do is we need to start cultivating consciousness, awareness, and joy so that the AI starts to reflect this consciousness, awareness, and joy rather than right now when you put two AIs together to chat to each other and when they think, pick up things from the internet, it's fighting, it's racism, it's angry. Why? Because it's just reflecting our consciousness. So really it's our responsibility to evolve ourselves for AI to then run in parallel with us that's more conscious rather than this ap apocalyptic idea that many people have. So the AI is basically a reflection of the society that builds it effectively. Well, where is it learning from? Yeah, from that society. And so the society then consumes more content that is negative content, which is the trend, unfortunately, then AI ends up becoming that content or byproduct of that. Well, look, the, the, the society that's uh, eating up all that negative energy hasn't done the work to be able to move away from fright, flight or freeze to be able to evolve itself into managing its own focus. And look, my work, all my books, all my talks is ultimately our responsibility to evolve. It's our very personal, very private responsibility where we can heal our pasts and evolve ourselves consciously so we can choose what we focus on, not to be slaves on what we think or what we've been told to focus on. And our fright or flight brain, our reptilian brain keeps going to the place of looking for danger and trying to sort of deal with it, you know? So we have to evolve and it's only up to us to be able to do that. And so what happens to these careers where there's so much restriction, careers like doctors, engineers, lawyers, bankers, accountants, right? I mean, if AI is going to evolve at such a rapid pace, do these careers then disappear because the machine will take over and do that for you? And if so, then where do these people go? So let's remember that when electricity came along, there was a, this exact same scare because people were like, well, all the jobs right now that are going to be replaced by electricity. And they did. And we know that. And now we all live quite comfortably with electricity and new jobs arrive, right? Mm -hmm. But there's two things I want to say is that anything that has repetition in it will mm -hmm. be recognized by automation and done better. So if your job is in any way repetitive anywhere, that part of your job will get taken away immediately. And eventually, parts of that general AI will also start taking up other parts of your job. So, so remember that everybody right now is being disrupted. It doesn't matter what job you're in. Some jobs will be disrupted sooner and some jobs eventually will be disrupted because that's just the way technology is going. Right. But we must also remember that we're moving towards a world called the zero marginal cost society. Right. And in this new world, everything that digitization touches becomes free and fully accessible to everybody. Think about communication, mm -hmm. and, uh, music, uh, entertainment, education. All these things are free. I mean, everybody's got access to them now. As long as you've got a Wi-Fi hotspot, you've got access. Mm -hmm. So we are also moving into a world that doesn't need us to be so um, stuck to survival. You know what I mean? More and more is available to us. You were telling me about how TikTok has become so big in Pakistan and how it's growing there. Yeah. And that's a, it's a poor nation, but they've got access to everything yeah. that America's got access to, everybody. So our access is changing as well, you know? So I don't think we must be that scared of where we're going because there's many, many positives of it. But here's the thing, is that whatever qualifications you had, whatever identity you had, over the next 10 years, you have to evolve it at a massive rate 
so that you can carry on adding value to a society that will be fundamentally different, not just because of technology, but look at how society is changing and how we are expecting new things and the fall of the patriarchy. I know in Pakistan, it's still very patriarchal, but around the world, the patriarchy is up for a question, you know, the masculine ideology, yeah. it's kind of like, it's not that important anymore, you know? Yeah. So, and also the dollar is also not the be all and end all of the world that we yeah. all once believed it to be. So of course, the value is shifting. Of course, exactly. So every part of society is having a challenge. And so we have to engage with this challenge, with the decision to be okay with discomfort, to learn through the discomfort and then pop out on the other side hopefully adding the value the world will need from us at that stage. So what you're saying is effectively, you know, it reminds me of my time in university, right? Or in school where I'm sitting in class and I have an open mind and all of this stuff is being thrown at you and you're a student, you're like, okay, yes, I'll take that in, I'll process it and I'll apply it and whatever, right? And then somehow, somewhere, we all kind of like lose that student inside yeah. of us and we become the know-it-all. Yeah. So what you're saying is... You need to be a student forever, especially in this rapidly changing life. And you don't know the answer. 90%, 100% of the time, maybe 99%, you probably don't have the answer. So as long as you're a student, yeah, you're okay. That's exactly what I'm saying. And what I'm saying is, not, not what I'm saying, I read somewhere that says in the future, everybody will go to university one week or you know, whatever it will be called then into education one week a month. So every week, every month for one week, you're retraining yourself and understanding what the new things are that are coming. And so right now, our society is very much about outputs, not inputs. Mm -hmm. And so our input is limited because we're so stuck on quarterly profits and survival mm -hmm. and efficiencies and economies of scale that there isn't much input. So I think the mix of input and output will start to change as we move into the future. Will this affect consumerism? And what would consumerism look like in this kind of an environment? So I think every part of the world um, has a different I, like space in consumerism. So the way I see consumerism around the world, there's three major markets in the world. You right. have the less affluent awareness, which is people that value value. They, they, they want to be able to stretch their pesos, their dollar, their rupee yep. as far as they can. Then no matter where they are, if they're in the slums of India, in the townships of South Africa, in the slums of Mexico, they're exactly the same. They've got to stretch their value. And you can see that with the proliferation of cheap, very bad for you energy drinks that are in all these markets. Why? For one pesos, you don't have to eat for the rest of the day. The fact that you're getting cancer is irrelevant, but I mean, yeah. you're in survival mode, right? Then you get the emerging markets right. around the world that are Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, Dubai, Johannesburg. These, these cities around the world, their generation ago, one generation ago, Dubai were fishermen. In South Africa, the black up-and-coming market, there was no money in that market. China, there were farmers. Kuala Lumpur, there were farmers. And now all of a sudden, this is the first time this generation's got money. Guess what? Conspicuous consumption from here to the cows come home, Louis Vuitton's as much as you can. Absolutely. And then you get the mature awareness market, which is all about like mega, the mega trend that drives their behavior is guilt-free consumption. Riding bicycles, wearing normcore fashion, going to food markets to buy your food, disconnecting from TV, disconnecting from fashion, watches, all those things. So, look, consumerism, I think, always is based on consciousness. Is Where does your consciousness lie? What are you valuing? And what are you allowing other people to determine what your value is? Especially in a uh, conspicuous consumption, an emerging market, this is all about how everybody else sees me. Whereas... In the mature awareness market, there's a much less to that. So we have to also just play which market you're playing in, which part of that market are you playing in. But I saw something the other day, which I thought was really good. You know, you have B2C, obviously we know that. B2B, we know that. Then we have an involvement of B2H, which is B2 human. No matter if they're working in an organization or not, they're still, you're still dealing with a human. And right. then I saw a new one called B2A, which is business to avatar. And that is the oh, metaverse, okay. when you start selling into the metaverse and the sort of avatars of metaverse. No, and so that's interesting. Uh, you know, you mentioned this concept of consumerism. That I was reading this prospectus of this new electric car company, Lucid, which is yes. in the US, right? And if you read their first investor presentation, they talk about this concept of post-luxury. Yes. And their idea is that once you've attained all of those benchmarks, right, it starts with that 
branded cologne, then it goes to a branded watch, then the bags and the, you know, sort of more expensive items. And once you've attained all of them, suddenly you go back to the basics and the guilt-free consumption, and they've branded this as, as post-luxury. Now, the question that I come up with is that, okay, fine, we're evolving, and the digital device, the phone, allows everyone to create content and get monetization, right? I talked to you about TikTok in Pakistan. People are making money sitting in villages. If we raise the global standard of living such that people have enough to eat and survive because they have a phone and are creating content and are monetized, then everyone is focused on not just living or sort of figuring out their next meal. Where does that focus shift towards if everyone is satiated for their next meal? Yeah, I think the thing is, is if you look at the Scandinavian countries, they're already living that. They, they're not hungry. They're not in survival mode. The, the, yeah. Yeah. And also remember that the middle class has never been bigger. You know, the world middle class is growing exponentially and we have more people getting access to more information using better technology at cheaper prices. We are in the massive evolvement already and already we're starting to see a lot of benefits that come out of this scenario. Right. What I do see in many Scandinavian countries is a lack of ambition. Though. Okay. Is, you get to a point where, you know, everything's done. Like everything's you fine. The communities that you talked about earlier, yeah. but everything else covered. Now yeah. you're existing in a state of sort of fluid happiness. Yeah, that's it. And, and you know, when I work with Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies, they are so different to the people from Singularity. Singularity sits in San Francisco. Right. And these guys live in Copenhagen. Right. And the level of energy and pace and ambition is fundamentally different. Because in Copenhagen, there's no hurry. You know, we're doing things at a pace. Uh, things are slow. We ride a bicycle to work. Right. Things are stable. You know, I have a small house in the forest that I go with my little boat to when right. it's good. In San Francisco, it's like, okay, what else can we do? How many more conferences around the world can we grow? So, look, I think, again, nobody really knows what it's going to happen when we move into the future. There's both of these scenarios. You know, America's got more money than anything, but their ambition is still yeah. skyrocketing and the Scandinavians are much more relaxed and uh, happy with their bicycles. You know? That's interesting. Imagine the world, if the entire world becomes like Scandinavia, there's no way we're getting to Mars then. <laughs> well, look, remember, AI will start doing a lot of the thinking for us. Right. And already, we're starting to see many of these very powerful computers that are able to predict diseases that will come in the future and then create the medicine for them already. Wow. So, so they're we, building demand and supply at the same time. At the same time and moving at pace and they're preempting like 10 years ahead of us to That's say, it. look, these are the possible diseases and here are the possible medications. And so this now will start proliferating every touch point of our lives. And right now right. we're very comfortable to give our power away to Google Maps yep. to tell us where to go. And also for AI to tell us what music to listen to on Spotify yeah. Then it will tell us what to wear, where to eat, what to eat, who to date, what holidays to go on. And slowly but surely, this will become part and parcel of our lives. Some people are very panicked about this. And I agree there could be pros and cons to it. But I also think that when you're not worried about where you're driving, you can focus on the beauty of the road. So there's also that pro, you know. So there's pros and cons in all of these things. So then, I mean, if, if, if it's going to take away so much from us in terms of our thinking of repetitive, mundane tasks every day, right? Then is the real skill that we all should be working towards creativity? Because that's one thing that maybe, AI, because that's not repetitive, right? Creativity yeah, yeah. is unique. It's learned. It's acquired. It's, it's through experiences, right? Positive, Look, yeah. positive, global travel, whatever it is. Look, so is I creativity the currency of the future? Uh, intuition. I call it intuition, but okay. creativity, uh, excitement, fascination. Um, but let me let me say this: is the Black Plague um, in the 1300s wiped out two thirds of Europe, and only because of that death, destruction, and implosion of the existing society was there a birth and a new consciousness that was that was brought about called the Italian Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And in that Italian Renaissance, for the very first time as humans, we could celebrate beauty, art, and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And we still celebrate the beauty, art, and knowledge from them. We are now going through, 
I would think an even bigger transformation and transition away from the industrial world into the quantum world. And as we move into this new world, the currency of the future will become human uniqueness. So the renaissance that we will be having and we're moving towards is human genius. Because when everything rudimentary is being taken care of by AI and data, what's left? It's our uniqueness. It's our creativity and our value that we add to the world. And we can see this very much with your friends or the people that in Pakistan, from the villages that are making money, what are they doing? They're selling their very unique Absolutely. ingredients. Now, Absolutely. The creator economy last year did $8 billion turnover. And that's somebody who's figured out what they're good at and are able to have a, a tribe of people around the world willing to pay them $2 a month you know, on Patreon or any of these platforms. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, everybody becomes a creator. Everybody starts to evolve into a place where they can start selling their unique signature into the world. That is so interesting. And if, that, and if it's only $8 billion right now, can you imagine the potential it has to grow? Absolutely. Because, I mean, if you compare it to, let's say, something as big and obvious as the beauty industry, which is, I think it's close to $500 billion, right? Wow. You know, and this has been evolved over centuries. Yeah. This industry just started like two years ago. Yeah. At 8 billion. I think the future is crazy for this. And, you know, I think what that means is that means that our education system then needs to completely change. What we learn in school, geography, history, math, calculus. I mean, shouldn't the subjects be changing to teach people how to sort of portray themselves, create content, build audiences, learn how to communicate. Shouldn't that be what we teach people in school and then learn how to manage the money that Google pays you? Because if you're a 14-year-old content creator or a 10-year-old, you need to learn how to manage your money very quickly, not when you're 22, when you're first getting a job. Absolutely. But I don't think Google will be part of our creator economy when we move into Web3, to be honest. I think blockchain will take care of that in a different manner. Right. But I do think that Firstly, schooling must be very much based on a hyper-personalized process. You know, I, children, I was terrible at school. And I, for the longest time, I thought I was stupid because I couldn't, I didn't understand. I couldn't learn quickly. I learned through practicality and conversations. I don't, I can't sit on down on a book and read it. That's just not the way I learn. Right. So I think first and foremost, education must become personalized and it's not personalized right now. The second thing I think we need to do is we need to be able to expose our children to as many different subjects, startups, businesses, and people as possible throughout their formative years so that they can pick up on what they enjoy and what they don't enjoy, right. what, what's triggering their passion and their uniqueness. And right. then once they've figured that out, is to really give them the tools to dive deeper and deeper into that subject format and at the same time, practically trying to make money out of it, giving them the tools to understand how to be creators. And I had some friends, I, I mean, I've got them still here, yeah, the friends in Dubai, but about three years ago, they were complaining to me that their 14-year-old and 13-year-old son were spending too much time on Instagram. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, I, I hear you, but shouldn't you be teaching them how to sell on Instagram? Right. Shouldn't you be teaching them how to run a business on Instagram? Just right. because you're not on Instagram doesn't mean that's not where their people are. Right. So I think firstly, personalized. Secondly, Passion, asking questions, becoming unique. Thirdly, tools to become internet-based entrepreneurs because all of a sudden your market goes from local, not to national, but global. All of a sudden you have 5 billion people. There's an opportunity to pay you $1 a month. I mean, geez, I mean, you can live large. Absolutely. In fact, I had the same problem with my nine-year-old, where she's 10 now, and too much time on Roblox. And I was like, look, I think we need to figure out how to sort of optimize this time helped her learn how to build a marketplace, build a store, build products, sell it to other people inside Roblox, build a YouTube channel that cross markets her store. And now she plays the game with a mindset of, oh, hey, how can I build more subscribers on my YouTube channel that I can drive to the marketplace? There we go. Product. Well done to you, yeah. man. That's exactly. I think that so she still spends a lot of time on the game. That hasn't solved the problem, but she's approaching it differently. Yeah. And what I would do, Faison, I would go one step further and build a community of her friends that can meet in person and then work through problems like that that are technically based. So that she's still having a common ground or goal with people that she can meet. Because we, we mustn't lose that interaction with people. And you also can't get them to come together for some ARB hobby. you got to also bring them together for a hobby that they're excited about, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. I want to switch gears into something that you talked about. You said you were never good at school, yet here you are, 
four books down, fifth book coming out. Yeah. I mean, you know, typically you think of a book writer, someone super academic, goes off into the forest and writes his book sitting in a cottage, right? Yeah. How, I mean, tell me, how did you end up becoming a writer and how has that changed you? You know, when I think about it, I was bad at school because I didn't enjoy the subjects I was being taught. I wasn't bad at school. Mm. I was, the, the, the options that I had available to me were biology, history, geography, English, maths, and accounting. And those are all, I hate all of those. I can't stand any of them. In fact, I outsource all those aspects of my life now right. to other people. Right. What I realized at 40 years old was the prioritization of my unique passion. And when I prioritize that unique passion, which is about psychology and the future, that is very easy for me to spend hours researching, writing, thinking, sharing, easy. I, you know, when I chill out at night, I'm often doing the work that you heard me talk about in Egypt because in my relax mode, that's what I'm relaxing doing. It's not work for me. It's simple for right. me. Okay. So I'm able to access my sort of fluid genius, which we all have. It's not just me. We all have genius pockets above our heads. Right. Our jobs become how do you get out of your own way and access that? And that is always pinpointed by an emotion called excitement. We, mm. mustn't, we mustn't take away anything from that emotion because when, when I feel excited, when I get goosebumps, it, it feels like I am in line with my purpose. I am in line with my soul, however you want to call it. And it's at that time where I can write and write and write and I keep writing. I mean, so it's like it's easy now, you know. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So like you just sit and you write and it all comes together. I mean, so any, you're basically saying that anyone can access this fluid genius yes. and become a writer. Well, look, everybody expresses themselves differently and communicates differently. So I don't think everybody can. I think if you want to, of course right. you can. The way I do it is I always start off with a 10-slide presentation. So okay. I start with a 10-slide presentation because I can speak well. I can tell stories. Every slide, let's say, is a three- or four-minute story mm -hmm. that's answering one specific question. Mm -hmm. Now, my first book was How Big, How Bold, and How Courageous is Your Thinking for the Future? What's Your Moonshot? And in that space when I wrote What's Your Moonshot?, it was that that was the one question I wanted to answer. I had 10 slides. I expressed those 10 slides over like, let's say, 50 minutes. And I filmed that 50 minutes. And then I went and I got that 50 minutes transcribed. And that was the basis of my book. And then I started writing on top of that, expanding on it, voice noting. And I started working with a copywriter who helped me chisel it. And that's kind of been my process ever since, you know, is... Build the talk, build it a simple talk, answer one question, film the talk, use that as the basis, and there you go. You've just given the template on how yes. to write a book. I think that's brilliant. I think that in itself is a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's my way, right? Because right. that's how I'm good at speaking. Some other people do their best thinking in writing. I do my best thinking in speaking. So I, I had to film it. And once I filmed it, then it started to make sense, you know? Do you think everyone should write a book? Once Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, you don't realize how many stories and how many ideas you have on repetition inside your head. On constant repetition, you keep thinking the same things. And so when you've write, written a book, you almost like download and get rid of all those stories and ideas and thought processes onto a page, clean yourself and get ready for the next one. And so wow. Feng, Shui, Feng Shui has a principle that says, in order to bring anything new into your life, get rid of the old. And so if you want something new, just get rid of the old and the new will come because you're making space for it. Very, very fascinating. This is good stuff. What's next for John? I mean, you're, you're everywhere. You're giving these great talks. I mean, what do we see from you next in terms of a book, in terms of a talk? What, what do we see? Look, I, I am very, very keen to... Um, you moved to Dubai, I, I, I know. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. No, no, I'm living I'm in Dubai. That's yeah. one thing that's new for you. Yes, yes. I, I, I am in Dubai, but I'm always writing a new book. I've got a, my new book comes out in two months, but I've already started my newer one. It's called Future Memories, uh, A Brief History of Your Future. And it's about um, our new understanding of quantum science and how it affects timelines. You know, we come from a reality where time is linear. 
where Newtonian science gave us the principles of science in that way. But as we've evolved, we're starting to realize that quantum science and the rules around time are different. And so future memories is this idea that your memories don't come from the past. Your memories don't have time attached to them. If you think about something that happened to you last week and you're feeling that emotion now, that didn't happen last week. It's happening to you right now. And so we can now project future memories into our reality and bring them into fruition in a very new and exciting way. So for me, I'm still diving into that book. I still don't quite understand what I'm going to be writing. I'm still waiting for the downloads and the, and the fluid genius to clap, uh, to hit me, but that hasn't happened yet. So that, that's the one thing. I'm always uh, testing or trialing a technology uh, solution. Mm -hmm. And so we've just sort of like wrapped up an idea we were running called Meta Academy, which was about a decentralized meta universe or metaverse education uh, academy that we would bring people together, share the profits with them and get people to go from zero to one understanding the metaverse. I think that's the biggest sort of gap right now is nobody, nobody is teaching from zero to one. All the, everybody's teaching from one to 99. Yeah. So we wanted to solve that problem, but we started to realize that technology has become free these days. You know, yeah. nobody's paying for technology anymore. So we, we kind of stopped that. That was six months of work. So I'm always trialing a new technology. So another book, more talks, new technological solutions, and just travel. You know, I love travel. I'm going to to Pakistan should be on the cards for that. You need to come out and check out this market. Look, I, I, I uh, messaged you the other day about that yeah. conference. Uh, I definitely want to come speak for EO in Pakistan. I want to come spend time with you guys. I really got along with uh, the two Pakistanis that were there so yeah. well. So uh, I look forward to that. Yeah, I really want to come and explore the, the country. Awesome. John, thanks a lot for the time. I love the conversation as always. We've had you know, a number of these before, and I'm glad we were able to document this one. And I uh, would love to have you on again in the future. I and would love to be again again. Thank All you for watching the 13th episode of Digitales. We'll catch you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye.